So we couldn't include Julian Temple, the legendary filmmaker, in our Q&A as planned. He was having some connection issues in Somerset, which is the home of Glastonbury. But the reason why we wanted him to be part of the Q&A was because he runs and programs Cine Armageddon. And he wanted to show White Riot as part of the 2020 edition and the 50th anniversary celebrations because of what the film is, because of what the film says, how it connects the past with the present, music with film, activism and community. And so much has changed since the early discussions of uh, programming the film, but it's become essential viewing today. So it's great that the show could still go on, we could still preview the film, and we could have an amazing Q&A as part of a virtual preview and online discussion. So you can hear more from him about Cine Armageddon in conversation with Mark Commode last week on the BBC iPlayer. Hi everybody, my name is Jan Supernova. Um, yeah, sorry for the technical difficulties, but we are back. Welcome along to the White Riot Q&A. Hopefully everyone that is watching this and joining us on this panel uh, to see the Q&A, you've seen the film, uh, but if you haven't, I'll kind of give you the rundown. So it's a brand new film called White Riot, and it's about the rock against racism movement in the 70s, uh, the fight against the rising right-wing extremism and the national funk gaining ground. And the film follows the movement up until the 100,000 people march from Trafalgar Square to Victoria Park, where the Clash famously performed White Riot. It's directed by Ruby Kashar. She's going to be on the panel today. And the film so far has won Best Documentary at the London Film Festival. It's had a special mention for the at the Crystal Bear at the Berlin Film Festival. And it's going to be out in all cinemas in September. But during summer, there's preview screenings and Q&As. And it's been selected as part of Glastonbury's uh, Cine Armageddon programming. So like I said, I've got a great panel. I've got the director, Ruby Kashar. I've got the producer, Ed Gibbs. We have got musician and activist, Billy Bragg. We have got Pervez Bilgrami, who's part of the Asian punk band. He's also a contributor in the film, the Asian punk band that are called Alien Culture. And we've also got Julian Temple as well. So I will jump straight in and I'm gonna come over and talk to you, Ruby Firstly, um, incredible film. I loved it. It was a story that I'm not familiar with at all. Um, and I watched it twice. So the first time I watched it, I just really enjoyed you know, the story and, 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 and learning so many new things. And the second time I watched it, I was looking at the details and the way that it was made and the graphics. And yeah, I just thought it's something that everybody should watch. Like September, I'm telling everybody, go and watch it. Um, so first of all, talk, talk to me about the initial ideas of how the film came about. Um, well, firstly, thank you so much for a great opening. That's amazing to hear that you watched it twice. Um, so we we were um, just watching videos on YouTube and we came across the clash footage at Victoria Park. And, um, you know, when you watch it, you see that there's like 100,000 people in the audience and it's, you know, it's big, big gig. And, you know, I found myself as a bit of a muso and I, I was like, you know, where, what was this gig? When did this happen? What was this festival? And as I started to find out more and more about it, it was um, a, a movement called Rockets Racism that put that on. And um, so I got went to the beginning of the story and it's basically just five people that came together and started this movement called Rockets Racism. And it ended with, um, the, well, the movement didn't end, but our film ends with the carnival, which is a, one of the first big moments of um, Rock Against Racism. I find it so strange that, you know, I, I hadn't known about this before. And I was in the garden yesterday with my neighbour, Tom. And Tom is around sort of, I guess, like late 60s. And I was like, oh, Tom, we're doing this thing. You know, I watched this film called White Riot and it's about Rock Against Racism. He's like, oh, I went to all of those gigs. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, but I've yeah, never not been familiar with it. So why do you think it's taken, I guess, 40 years for this incredible thing that happened to, to be told? Um, it's it's crazy. Like we couldn't believe it when we found out this story hadn't really been told, you know, in the form that we want to tell it. It's been um, it's been told in news stories and there's little bits and pieces, you know, and anniversary pieces that pop up here and there. But there's nothing that's like an in-depth look in the way that we wanted to make this film. Um, and I think it's just, you know, the cultural gatekeepers at the time just decided that they didn't you know, want to make this film. Um, and but you know on the flip side of that you know I'm really happy that we got to make this mm -hmm. film you know it's an incredible story and I'm just so happy that it's out there now people are watching it they're responding to it and you know it's an important story and an important lesson I think in British contemporary history 
And it feels very timely with everything that is happening with the Black Lives Matter movement and the conversations and the shifting uh, that, that people have been going through. Um, so how did you feel as a woman of colour editing some of the footage? Because I know that I felt uncomfortable, you know, watching the Enoch Powell um, speeches or, or just or watching the guy that was from the, um, from the National Front, you know, saying that they'll make them leave, you know, um, in inflammatory language like that. How did it make you feel? Yeah. So that's like what we have in our film is, you know, some of the worst footage, but also just a tip of, of the iceberg of, you know, of the rushes that we had to go through. Um, you know, we went on a massive archive expedition in terms of like collecting different pieces of archive news media. And, you know, a lot of it is just horrible, horrible stuff. Um, you know, when I think back to what I knew five years ago about that era, you know, I'd seen the Rivers of Blood speech or heard it rather, you know, so I, I thought I knew quite a lot. But then when you're actually in the edit and you're watching the kind of vile language and the violence, the level of violence at the time, you know, it really does hit you. Um, you know, it, it was just incredible that that um, Rock Against Racism achieved what it did achieve at that time. Definitely. And on the second time of me watching it, I was really sort of fascinated uh, by the imagery and the graphics and the way that the way that it was edited together. It's kind of like you took the fanzine, which was like temporary hoarding, which was a fanzine that got distributed from Rock Against Racism and kind of used that style, I guess, to take you from scene to scene. Um, talk to me about that process. So we, when we um, first like stumbled across the story and we'd go and talk to people about it, we went to talk to Red and Ruth and various other people that were involved in the movement, they would pull out this fanzine, you know, and it's massive. And it's like, you know, one of these old broadsheets, like the size of it. And when you open it and you start to look at the graphics, they're just so evocative of the time. And they feel actually really contemporary because, you know, you wouldn't think, oh, this is something that happened 40 years ago. So we were like straight away, right, we want to use these um, as part of the, you know, imagery of the film. How are we going to do that? We made a short film a few years ago, actually called White Riot London, which gave us an opportunity to test out like some 2D animation techniques, which look really scrapbooky on screen, but actually take lots and lots of man hours. Mm. We worked with an amazing um, animator called Levan, who's put a lot of time into the film as well. Um, and so, yeah, I'm so glad it's just come together like how it has. And Eddie, tell me a little bit about your relationship with the film, how you came on board and yeah. Well, me, well, I mean, I work very closely with Ruby Kerr um, and have done for many years. Um, we worked on a bunch of stuff together. So, um, you know, this was just a kind of a natural process for me to be involved with this, really, um, from the beginning. Um, I kind of heard about racism when I was a kid, but I didn't really know much about it, I suppose. Um, and uh, I just wanted to mention, actually, with the fanzine, that the thing about temporary hoarding, um, I just wanted to add to what Rebecca said was, that it reported what we've really found fascinating was the content that was that it was reporting stuff that the, the mainstream media was not covering at all. And it really felt like it was a, you know, really genuinely giving a voice to people who didn't have a voice that were being denied a voice, sorry, by the mainstream media. So um, that was really important. And uh, when you think about um, the craziness of the time and, and what was considered, you know, acceptable, on mainstream media and mainstream television, you know, it was really important, I think, for outlets like this um, mm. to exist. Yeah, yeah, I, I love the fanzine. I thought they were so bold with the with the messaging. It was very much like it was like. I guess that like the kind of journalism that you're screaming for, like be honest, be bold, be investigative, uh, spread knowledge. It, it did all those things. And I think if I was a kid and I would have come across it, I would have fallen in, in love with it, you know. Um, I'm going to bring in the rest of the panel. Uh, so I'm going to bring in Billy Bragg. I'm going to bring in uh, Pervez as well. Um, so I think I'll have a have a little chat with, um, with you, Billy. Um, so first off, Billy, what was your connection to Rock Against Racism? I think my generation had found the issue that was going to define us. Like the previous generation had been defined by their opposition to the Vietnam War. The generation before them had been defined by their opposition to nuclear weapons. My generation were going to define themselves in opposition to discrimination of all kinds, not just racism, but all kinds of discrimination. Uh, because in the park that day, um, when Tom Robinson sang Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay, a load of the guys standing around me and my mates started kissing. And now I was 19, I grew up in Barking in East London. I'd never met an out gay man. I'm sure I'd met gay men, but I'd never met an out gay man. 
And I was absolutely shocked by this. We, we basically, we marched in front of a banner that said gays against the Nazis. That's where we just have to be standing, you know. And I was like, my initial feeling rather foolishly was, why are these gay people at this, this march is about racism? But it didn't take me five minutes to for the penny to drop and to realise that the National Front were against anybody who was in any way different. It wasn't just about race. It was about all kinds of discrimination. So consequently, I was able to to take that information away and, and be part of that generation that went on to have two-tone, uh, you know, Artists Against Apartheid, the Nelson Mandela concerts, It's all and Red Wedge, which I was also involved in. It's all traced back to that activism that was sparked by Rock Against Racism. At the time, I, I believe, because of punk rock, that music could change the world. I now know, because of my own experience as an artist, that music can't change the world, but it can change your perspective of the world. And that's what happened to me in Victoria Park that day. Although I came out, it was a Sunday, I came out, I went home, my mum did liver and bacon, same as she did every Sunday, the world hadn't changed. But my perspective of it changed to such an extent that there would be no Billy Bragg if it wasn't for what happened in the park on that Sunday afternoon in 1978. Well, that's beautiful, Billy. And tell tell me then, sort of, you know, when that when that activism was, I guess, like sparked in you, and then all these years later, you now, you know, run the left field tent um, at, at Glastonbury, which is all about recharging your activism. Uh, tell me about the ethos is ethos is there, and is there kind of any parallels to what you discovered as a kid? I think there is, yeah. And I think the parallels are that pop and politics do mix. You know, uh, you have to remember in the in the twentieth century. Um, Pop music was the only social media available to young people. It was the only way to express yourself, not just as an artist, but also as a as an individual by the music that you listen to, by the, the you know the bands that you listen to, the artists you listen to. They told you how to uh, dress, who to hang out with, what you know, what places to go. It was completely our social media. Now, um, that that sort of thing is uh, music is kind of. Um, in many ways, digitization has kind of uh, uh, broken up that central sense of music being a vanguard for youth culture. But but the idea that you can get power from being in an audience that's singing together, that's expressing a view together, that's cheering a particular idea together, that the audience can have their activism recharged, as my activism was sparked by that day in the park in uh, in, in Hackney, that, that idea runs through, I think it runs right through Glastonbury Festival, because... Mm-hmm. In many ways, Glastonbury came of age as a focus for the people who were opposed to Margaret Thatcher. And one of the reasons why the National Front disappeared, it wasn't just the pressure from those of us who opposed to it, it's also because Margaret Thatcher co-opted some of their ideas. And she she took that she took that idea, you know, the the uh, anti-immigrant ideas forward. So many of us who've been part of Rocking its racism went on to be part of various anti-Thatcher activism, and Glasgow was was the place we all came together to celebrate that. And so, Leftfield being at Glastonbury, I don't I don't can't imagine it would be anywhere else. The spirit of Rock Against Racism runs right through Glastonbury like like letters letters through a stick of rock. What are you know as, as an activist now? What are some of the press, pressing issues that you're fighting for now? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I, I thought of watching uh, Rubika's brilliant film was that when we were marching against the National Front, it was relatively straightforward. They were fascists. They were over there. You could see them. They had the Union Jacks. They're all skinheads. It was relatively straightforward. It wasn't anything really to do with us. But what I think has happened, particularly in the last uh, few weeks since the death of George Floyd, is that um, white people have begun to realise that they are part of the problem, that being against racism is not the same as being anti-racist. That you have to do more than just say, well, it's nothing to do with me. I'm not a racist. It's some, you know, it's somebody else's issue. And I think that understanding and the way that that um, structural racism has become visible through notions such as white privilege has allowed people like myself who stood to realise it's not just about the national front. It's about all of us and how we deal with each other and how we um, the role we have in. Society. I think that's what's different, and that's a, that's a huge leap forward. But it it's it's spark comes from from rock against racism, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Billy. Um, Pervez, I'd love to speak to you next. So um, you feature in the film um, 
as you and your, you and your bandmates and you uh, you know you've, you've come you're sort of featured quite lovely in the film you pop up in different moments and you're you're definitely part of um the, the main thread um why was it important for you to have your story told yeah, I think um, my experience of the carnival is exactly um, Billy's experience of the carnival, um, but um, you can't take the carnival in isolation. So the day of the carnival, uh, we didn't know, like the organisers organizers of RA, didn't know what sort of, um, what the numbers were that were going to turn up. So me and my friends, um, um, you know, Sarge and us, we got on got on to the North Line, didn't know what to expect. We, we got off and Trafalgar Square was just full of people. Now we had two choices. We could either just go for gig or we could march. And uh, all the bands that were, were on the gig were, were really, you know, we're big fans of those bands. Uh, but we felt we had to march purely because um, as an Asian, you could not go to Hoxton, you couldn't go to Bethnal Green, you couldn't walk those streets. So. It was our only chance ever to walk those streets. Um, and we walked through Hoxton, Bethnal Green, whichever the areas were. And um, we saw these pubs with skinheads, with National Front supporters, Zeke Heiling. And we stopped and we looked at them. Um, and um, normally when we'd come across racists, they'd always be in a gang. So there'd be one of you, three of them, two of you, eight of them. We, we were always outnumbered. Um, on that day, we outnumbered them, and I just said, say, if you're yours, so come on, what are you going to do about it? And like like Billy, we took strength from that. Um, uh, but you can't you can't um, talk about the carnival in isolation. You have to talk about the story of immigrants. So um, um, as a, a staff, uh, we came to this country in the mid 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 60s. Um, everything was fine till um, April 1968 when uh, Enoch Powell made that speech. Uh, suddenly everything changed, uh, the language changed. Um, we were called Pakis, we were called Curry. Paki bashing um, came on the agenda. And so, uh, 68 was a big year for me. I went from junior school, which was multicultural, to a grammar school that was predominantly white. And the first thing I saw was they wanted to beat me up because I was a pucky. And I spent, I think, the first six months of that school trying to escape them. Um, I was speaking to a friend of mine uh, earlier, who, who, um, who was the sister of us, who I went, went to the raw gig with in, in Victoria Park. And she said he had to run home at four o'clock every day because he was liable to get beaten up. So throughout the 70s, you had this, um, and you felt no one was on your side, and you thought at least musicians would be on your side. You know, I, I grew up listening to Dylan. I grew up listening to Nash and Young. I thought at least the musicians were on our side, and then suddenly you get um, Eric Clapton, you get Rod Stewart, you get David Bowie, and then you suddenly realize, well, they're, 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 there's no one, no one on our side, uh, until that letter. And you know, as soon as I read that letter, it's just it's a really small letter compared to some of the letters you got on the NME sound music, uh, um, Melody Maker. And it just suddenly made me think, well, yeah, well, actually, we've got we've got at least four people on us. Um, but throughout that time, even up to the leading up to the carnival, you know, um, young Asians like us were being killed. You know, Gurdip Singh uh, Chaga was killed in 76 when he was killed. The National Front led one down, a million to go. Wow. Um, um, uh, I think a month before the carnival, or the month of the carnival, Kenneth Singh was killed. Um, in the May of '78, I think Altab Ali was killed, and uh, after Ali Beg was killed in, in Newham, and when he was killed, it was for a five-pound bet. So um, the origins of the band simply are that we just couldn't take it anymore. We just didn't want to let white people fight our fight for us. It was our fight as well. It was black people's fight. So we, we had to contribute something. Yeah. So we draw. That, that was simply, and we formed a band. Yeah, tell me tell me about the band. So Alien Culture, um, yeah. tell me about the start of it. Tell me about the ethos that you guys had. And tell me a highlight of your, of your journey and being the band. What was your favorite moment? Um, okay, um, we started the band because we wanted to get more, more Asians to go to uh, political rallies. We, want, we wanted more Asians to, to picket national front meetings. We wanted more Asians to go to punk gigs. Um, just be a bit more radical. Um, we couldn't figure out a, a way of doing it, so we just adopted the, the, um, the, the desperate bicycles ethic of um, forming a band saying, easy, it's quick, go and do it. So this is what we did. 
Um, um, we formed the band. Um, uh, my favorite moment, um, there, 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 there were two moments. One was um, the 101 Club, um, which, which got trashed. Uh, we were on stage. Um, and it was the only time I couldn't see anyone in the audience because there were spotlights. Um, we came, we came off the stage. Uh, Kate Webb of Ra came running up to me and said, "Oh, you're great, but by the way, do you know, do you know the Croydon National Front are out there?" And so it, 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 that was that was one sort of highlight. The, the other it, it, people always think that um, Ra was always this earnest anti-fascist thing, but people have got to realise that Ra was fun. It was great putting on gigs. It was great playing at those gigs. And one of those gigs, um, you know, we, we had to go where people asked us to go. So um, once they asked us to go to the East End, we had to play in the East End. We had to play North East London, Poly, um, Stratford. Um, and uh, it was difficult going there, uh, but we had to play. Um, we did a sound check and me and Azza, the drummer in the band, we just sat in the bar. This is, this is, this is a funny moment for me. Um, and we we're always wary that after 101 Club, that another gig would get trashed. So through the, through the door walked in 30 very, very big and burly men. And I looked at Azza, Azza looked at me and our hearts just fell. And so they stood at the bar. And uh, after a while our drinks finished, I'd bought the first round. So I said to Azza, it's your round, you, you, you go to the bar. They were at the bar. I said, yeah, it's your round, you go and get the drink. <laughs> anyway, it, all credit to him, he went to get the drink. And then one of these guys started walking towards him. So I just ran over. I, you know, there's nothing I could have done. I walked over, and he, he came up to Azza, and he said, um, "By the way, if you get any trouble here, we're here." And they were uh, the Hackney Reds. And it's, just, it's a really uplifting moment when you when when you're always sitting there at a raw gig or at an Asian country gig, thinking people are going to come because you're an Asian, but and, and trash. But these were supporters and we had people like that all the time with us we had around a core 50 people who basically protected us and you know anytime there was trouble they were around us you know there's harrow rocket rock against racism there was a, a bunch of kids strange you know the skins south london anarchist group they came everywhere with us if it meant going to birmingham they came to birmingham with us. so those are two moments that i think of our history, which one was a really low point, was a really high point. Yeah, yeah. And what, and what about now then? Do you feel like there is enough representation of Asian artists in the mainstream music industry in the UK? Uh, th I don't think there ever is. I don't think uh, it's got a long way to go. I don't think there are enough people representing the arts, which is, which is a, a great, a, which is why Rubika's film, I think, is a great thing that it's doing so well. I, I have to say, it's doing so well because it's a really good film. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a good film on many levels. And one of the shocking things about it is that you could take the thugs from the National Front from that film and put them in Parliament Square three weeks ago. And you could take the English Defence League and those football fans and put them in the film. There's no difference between those people. And that's the frightening thing in this in intervening 40 years. That's what Rebecca's film has brought down, these intervening 40 years. Those people are still there. Their minds have not been changed. It's how we change their minds. And just, just you know, coming back to um, Asians representing the arts, I think, you know, there's the Tara Arts Group in in, um, in South London who have been, basically been around uh, 40 years, as long as Alien, since Alien Culture started. They don't get enough funding. They, they, they may well go down because they don't receive enough funding. So essentially, we, we you need um, more black people, you need more Asian people, but it starts early on. It doesn't start now. You can't just put in a, a direct, say, direct film. You've got to go back to when, when kids are can say, you are as good as everyone else. Watch this film. What do you think about this film? Get them to contribute and get them basically interested in things. Otherwise, it's, it's never going to happen, and it, it will just always be totally dominated. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Bevez. I'm going to open it up now. I've got a couple of questions for, for anyone can answer, but I'll start with one for you, Rebecca. Um, 
about the contributors so spending time with contributors and talking to them you know what really kind of I guess like I guess warmed my heart and inspired me is that these these people gave their skills they gave their time they gave their resources that they they put their safety on the line to, to do this you know really gave their life to, to a cause and to a movement um when you sat and you spoke to them like what what came out what what fueled them to to give in that in such a way you know because they could have easily have been like it doesn't affect us. We can carry. We, I'm not racist, but you know, it doesn't affect us. I think. I think it was. Um, I think it was the fact that they actually probably hadn't been um, asked about it enough. And so when we went knocking on their doors, you know, they were really excited that you know there's a new generation of people that are interested in this because you know I wasn't at the carnival, uh, but I was excited by it, and I knew that you know what happened then in the late 70s that represented so much of what I was trying to say myself through film and through the arts. Um, so I knew that this story was something that, you know, I was passionate about. And I think that that's infectious. You know, Ed was passionate about it. So when we went to sit down and talk to people about it, and, you know, you, you've kind of got this renewed sense of like, you know, yes, this happened 40 years ago. But you know what? Let's tell this story. Let's do this. And actually, Red, we sat down with quite a few times. And I think maybe by the end of it, he was feeling a bit like, right, OK, you know. It's, you've interviewed me like four or five times now, but, you know, it, Red himself, and I hope I've captured this in the film, is, you know, an amazing speaker, an amazing um, person, you know, that has many stories within his story of life um, that he could share. Um, so, yeah, that, that kind of touches on it. I love the, yeah. I love the, I love the footage of him as a character, the character, the, the whatever it was, Captain, whatever it was, with a cape on that you put in. Obviously, yeah. it was filmed for something different, but I love the yeah. way you kept cutting back to that. Because one of the funny things you forget about you forget about the people who organised Rock Against Racism was actually they were they were more to do with what happened in in some ways what happened in the 60s. You know, they were they were kind of like many of them inspired by what happened in 68 uh, with the students. That's where they got their politics from. And it was it was a kind of you know punk was supposed to be a year zero where we didn't have anything to do with the hippies, but actually. It was the long ears like Red and his friends in the film who actually were a driving force behind it. Uh, they very respectfully, because it was punk, cut their hair. But it, now you look back and you see where they were coming from. You realise that there was a there was a continuous line through the activism in the mm -hmm. 60s, the underground. I mean, I think Red says in the film we were the underground. And that mm -hmm. 60s underground never really, I never saw that 60s underground really manifest itself in mainstream culture. But I did see that. I feel I got a touch of that at the way with Rock Against Racism. Um, actually, talk to me about the relevance of the that the the image that keeps popping up—the guy with the long hair, with the looking like a kind of like a Viking, and he's in town and getting on buses. What was what was that? What was, what was that symbolic of? So um, that was a short film that Red had made ten years before, and we so we managed to hunt it down, and it represented. For me, it represented who he was because he's like this, you know, people say, oh, he's a larger than life character, which he is, you know, he's a creative guy. Yes, he is. But when you see that image, you realise, you know, that he kind of works on another level of creativity. You know, he's got humour, he's got passion, he's got, you know, political ideas and all these things come together to create something really new and exciting and fresh. And he's got a really funny story about that film because um, apparently, he says, um, it was filmed in Eric Clapton's garden. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How bad is that? Yeah. Um, so, that yeah. is strange. Due to our earlier link up issues, I'm back to conclude on our QA with White Riot director Rebecca Shaw, producer and co writer Ed Gibbs, with musician, activist, curator of Glastonbury's Left Field Tent, and a great supporter of Rock Against Racism, Billy Bragg, and 17th Asian punk band Alien Culture co founder and member Pervez Bilgrami. White Riot will be available to stream for the next week through Modern Films and the Edinburgh Film Festival online on Curzon Home Cinema. It will also be released in cinemas in September. Thank you so much to our panellists for their participation, their wise words, and our partners tonight, including Glastonbury's Cine Armageddon and Leftfield Tent, as well as the Edinburgh International Film Festival. There is some curated music and DJ sets also available on modernfilms.com, including a new lockdown cover of the special song, Racist Friend and Sam Cooke's A Change is Gonna Come by youth group Youth Sayers. Plus, White Riot inspired playlists from the filmmakers themselves, one of the legendary musician and broadcaster Tom Robinson, others by Gary Powell from the Libertines and Celeste Bell in homage to her mother Polystyrene, as well as artists Bill Brewster, Holly Cook and Dennis curated by Spiritland. Take care and follow the film through hashtag Modern Film and White Riot Film and please support the Rock Against Racism movement through its contemporary organisation Love Music, Hate Racism.